All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, so this is the Queen Strength Summer Digital Series number seven. And uh, today we're gonna to be talking about the force velocity curve. So if you've uh, been watching our other sessions, uh, you'll see obviously this is a slide we put up every week, but the goal of this weekly series is just to uh, kind of share our ideas and uh, methods on training and uh, just provide you with the information and knowledge you need to design your own training programs. Um, and it helps us let, or lets the athletes understand kind of the why behind what we do. So you've seen this slide before, uh, methods versus principles. So as to the methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are a few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. The man who tries methods, ignoring principles, is sure to have trouble. So what I'm gonna go over today, there's millions of ways you can accomplish what I'm gonna talk about. So don't think you have to be married to one thing here. So um, our goal is gonna be focusing on athleticism today. So at Queens, we wanna help develop more powerful and robust athletes. Uh, so our goal as strength conditioning coaches is create better athletes and let the sport coaches create better soccer players or football players or rugby players. So today, this focus is gonna be primarily on developing overall athleticism. And I don't really wanna kind of dive into one specific area of strength training or sports. So this is the force velocity curve. And all this is, is a, it's a model that visualizes the inverse relationship between force and velocity. So the red circles on the, on the curve here. So basically on, um, on the one side we have force and on the bottom we have velocity. So when the force output is really high, then velocity is gonna be really low. And we can look at an example of like a one rep max back squat. So if you've ever grinded out a, a back squat, you'll know that the speed is not very fast. Like when you hit the bottom and you're coming back up, you're pushing with everything you got, force output is really high and velocity is pretty low. Or alternatively, when velocity is really high, force output is really low. And we can look at something like reactive pogo jumps or if you were skipping. So velocity output is really fast okay, and you're moving quick or if you're sprinting um, and force output is this low. So that's all the force velocity curve shows is just the inverse relationship um, between force and velocity. And obviously in a perfect world, every athlete would have the ability to output um, a similar kind of ratio of force and velocity to create some power, uh, but we know that's not the case. So <clears throat> moving on here, um, research shows that we can break down sections of the force velocity curve and uh, we can classify these as max strength, accelerative strength, strength speed, speed strength, and speed. And obviously that's moving from the force end of the spectrum to the velocity end of the spectrum. So basically today I'm gonna to break down why these zones are important and how it helps us train our athletes. Okay, so if we look at the said principle, I discussed this I believe in our second weekly series, it's specific adaptations to impose demands. So your body specifically adapts to the stimulus is applied to it. Okay, so how does that apply to the force velocity curve? Well, if we know that when we're training max strength, we need a certain speed range or percentage, then we know that's exactly what we're training and we're gonna get that stimulus. So this might have a little bit of extra information that you don't really need to pay attention to, but I want you to kind of focus on the velocity parameter column on the, on the right. So we know for max strength, it's gonna be a mean velocity of less than 0.45 meters per second. Okay, so now obviously this will vary based on your experience and if it's an upper or lower body exercise, but that's what we're gonna be aiming for. Accelerative strength, Okay, we're moving down towards the velocity end of the spectrum, so it's gonna be a little faster. So it means we're moving between 0.45 and 0.75 meters per second. And as we keep going, we have strength speed, uh, which is 0.75 to one, speed strength, which is one to 1.5, and speed, which is 1.3 to 1.8, and can definitely be faster than that. So I'm gonna kind of break down and explain what each of these sections are, and obviously why they're important. But first, how do we measure the stimulus? So obviously those are pretty specific numbers, say 0.45 meters per second. It's kind of hard for us to just look at someone squatting and say, hey, that's moving at 0.45, or you need to speed that up or slow that down. So we do this by something called velocity-based training. And we have a device at Queens called GymAware. So if you look at the bottom picture, there's a small little black box in the corner, and it has a tether, which we can attach to, in this case, the pitcher, a dowel, or you can attach it to a barbell. And basically it measures, uh, measures a lot of things, but it can measure velocity of the implement. 
Okay, so in, in this picture, we're using it to measure the velocity of this athlete's jump or the height of their jump. It can measure power output, uh, displacement, things like that. And it provides instant feedback, which is displayed on an iPad for us to see rep to rep how the athlete is performing. So if you look at the top image, uh, the green numbers there, 1.35 to 1.9, that's a velocity range that has been inputted for that exercise. So basically, if the athlete is above or below that range, meaning they did not reach the range that we want them to, the iPad tells them right away, hey, you need to either speed it up or slow it down. Okay? And what that's good for is we don't have to worry about weight. So as long as the athlete is performing the exercise or the movement with intent and purpose, we know that it doesn't matter if they're moving 200 pounds or 300 pounds or 400 pounds, if they're getting the speed range that we want, we're getting that stimulus, which is that set principle. So we know they're gonna adapt to that stimulus. Okay, so when we look back at the uh, force velocity curve, what happens to that curve or our ability to produce force and velocity if we only train heavy? Okay, so now we're not all gonna be squatting a thousand pounds like, like Ray Williams here, but if we always go to the gym and we're always working on our squat, bench, deadlift, and just doing things that are heavy and slow, what's gonna happen to that, that force output? Okay, so obviously we know, okay, if we're adapting to that stimulus, our ability to produce force is gonna increase. So our, our curve will shift a little bit like this. Now what happens if we only train fast? Okay, so if we only did jumping, sprinting, uh, throwing, things like that, um, obviously that might be a little bit more relevant now that people are doing a lot more bodyweight workouts without access to a gym. But we can say, okay, if we only train fast, our velocity, our ability to create velocity will increase. Now, if we're looking to create uh, increased athleticism within the athletes, what do we want this to look like? So if the individual follows a well-rounded program that trains strength, speed, and power, ideally we're gonna get a shift of that force velocity curve to the right. So their ability to produce force has increased, their ability to produce velocity has increased, and subsequently their ability to create power will be more powerful has increased. Now that's an ideal situation. So now at the start of the lecture, I talked about how I wouldn't focus too much on a specific sport, but obviously there are variations to this. So as we can tell, obviously a football receiver might wanna work on a little bit more velocity and a lineman, offensive lineman, might wanna work on a little bit more on force production. So there's variations to this rule. But if we're looking to just create an all around, all equipped general athlete, we want to be training throughout the whole range of that curve. So why use velocity-based training? So what benefit does a velocity range have over traditional programming? And so I talked about this a little bit earlier. Does weight matter then? Which in our case, it doesn't as long as the athlete is putting 100% effort into the exercise. So we know um, our student athletes, they have a lot of stress in their life. They have class, uh, they got practice, they have exams, things like that. So if we use the gym aware and we say, okay, today we want to focus on um, strength speed, then we know, okay, we'll set the gym aware up so that we're training within that range. So it doesn't matter if they're tired or if they're ready to go, they can train within that speed range and that will dictate the weight. So we know if they're moving slower than we want, they have to lighten the weight. If they're moving faster than we need, then it means they can add some weight to the bar. Okay, it also helps create a competitive environment within uh, within the training center because athletes like to compete with each other. So they always try and hit their, hit their reps and be in that speed range. So how does this differ from traditional programming? Okay, so I guess traditional programming, we could classify as percent-based training. So usually you can see like, say for instance, in a program, there would be a, a five sets of five on a back squat at 65%, okay? For us, that would be considered the traditional programming. So, Let's look at some inefficiencies with percent-based training. And it doesn't mean that percent-based training is bad. It just means that we're looking at an alternative here and we'll look at some, some inefficiencies with some percent-based training. So obviously, time is a factor. So if you have multiple main lifts within your program, testing your one rep max can take several days or a week. So if we wanted to, for instance, one day squat, one day trap our deadlift and one day bench press, we were gonna use percentages for that we would have to test those three exercises. Now, if you've ever tested multiple lifts in the same day, you're pretty fatigued and tired. <laughs> it could be during the lift after multiple exercises. 
or at the end of the lift the next day, two, three days after. You'd be very sore. So you can also test a rep max and predict, but it still takes the same amount of time. It might even take a little bit longer sometimes. So if you have a bench press of 185 pounds for five repetitions, you can use the Apley equation, which would give you a predicted one rep max of 215 pounds. So it obviously takes a lot of time when we could just be training. <clears throat> As we move on here, there's fluctuations in your one rep max. So like I said, daily stressors can affect how you're feeling that day. And obviously in our situation, we're dealing with students and they have student life. So like I said before, lots of exams, quizzes, assignments, everything like that. So uh, research shows your one rep max can fluctuate 18% plus or minus. So that's a big jump. So using the VBT, allows us to kind of dial in that range that we want to train and make sure that we're adhering to that set principle and getting the adaptation to the stimulus that we want. So load is load. It's always the same. Only how you feel changes. So 200 pounds is always going to be 200 pounds on that barbell. It doesn't matter how you feel. Some days it might feel really heavy. Some days it might feel really light, but it's always going to be 200 pounds. Experience. Okay. So testing a one rep max with individuals who have a low training age is highly ineffective. Okay, this, is, this is ineffective because they can improve every session due to neural adaptations and technique adaptations. In addition, a high level of technique and mental focus are required to test your one rep max for it to be effective. So technique expresses strength. So fear can also be a factor. So we want to make it as safe as possible. So if we don't actually have to test a one rep max, then that would be an ideal situation. Right? I don't know about you guys, but... Every time I try and do a max squat, I'm pretty nervous. <clears throat> risk. So another inefficiency is risk. So as load increases, risk will always increase. We obviously want to be as safe as possible. So we have clips on the bars. We always use uh, spotters, uh, safety bars, everything like that. We do our best to make sure the athlete is always as safe as possible while they're training. But as load increases, risk will always increase. Okay, so we always take safety into account. So availability is always the best ability. If our athletes are injured, they aren't available to the coach, they can't play, they can't train, they can't practice. So we always try our best to keep them healthy and safe. <clears throat> so looking at that, how do we train the variables on the force velocity curve? So we went over those, those five variables and now we'll just dive a little bit in how to train them. So we have max strength and accelerative strength. So the speed ranges for these are a little bit different. Obviously max strength is gonna be a little bit slower but the movements are fairly similar. This generally are compound barbell movements, squat, bench, deadlift, rows, things like that, any sort of variations. So for instance, we use trap bar deadlifts, um, that would fall under this, depending on the speed range and what we're trying to focus on that day. So it can also be done with dumbbells, kettlebells, weighted vests, depending what equipment you have and how heavy they are, obviously. <clears throat> so moving from the strength to velocity side, we then have strength, speed, and speed strength. So a lot of times people get these confused because they're pretty similar and rightfully so. But a way I like to think about it is strength, speed is strength movements done with speed. So for instance, that bottom picture there, we have someone squatting, which is a strength movement done with speed. So they're going to be moving relatively quickly here. And speed strength is speed movements done with strength. So we see in the top picture, Someone's jumping with a trap bar, so it's a weighted jump. A jump is generally a speed movement, and we've added a bit of load, so we're doing it with strength. It's a nice, easy way for me to remember it. It's how I kind of teach our interns, and uh, hopefully that clarifies the difference there. So <clears throat> with strength speed, <clears throat> it's generally performed with bands or chains. Now, if you've worked out in, it in a public gym, you might have seen these before. Generally, bands are a little more common than chains. But how this works is we have more tension or load during a lift where you're at a mechanical advantage. Okay, so for instance, standing up in a squat, so the top part of the squat is gonna be easier than when you're at the bottom of the squat. So the bands provide more tension at the top of the squat. As you start your descent, the tension is reduced because there's less stretch on the band and it takes the relative load is, is decreased. So it makes it easier when you're at a mechanical disadvantage. And same with the chains. So for instance, in the, the bench press, as you bring the bar down to your chest, the lift gets harder because you're at a mechanical disadvantage. 
but there's less chain in the air, so it means the weight is lighter. As you press, you gain a mechanical advantage and you accelerate through the lift. And uh, at the top of the bench press, obviously, would be the easiest. <clears throat> so that's accommodating resistance. We would generally apply this method when we're training strength speed on the force velocity curve. And what this looks like visually is the band tension obviously increases exponentially as the bar height gets higher. The chain weight, nice even increase in weight. And obviously, if you don't have any chains or bands on the bar, the bar weight stays the same. Okay, one thing to consider if you're working with a, a large group of athletes or individuals, um, band tension will increase way more if the athlete's taller. Okay, so you might go on Amazon or wherever and buy some bands, and it might have a, a suggested resistance on the band. Like I might say the purple band is 20 pounds of resistance. Well, it's gonna be a lot more if I'm working with an athlete who's 6'11", right? That band is gonna stretch much more. So you need to take that into account. So as we move further towards the velocity range, we have speed strength. Okay, so speed strength is accomplished by performing exercises like weighted jumps uh, and variations of Olympic lifts. Okay, so we're looking to achieve triple extension when we're training this trait. So you can see here um, the athlete in the bottom doing the trap bar jump, uh, their ankles, knees, and hips are all extended. So they're jumping in the air, those joints are extended, okay, and then that's what we're looking for when we're trying to, to move quickly here. In the top, uh, this person looks like they're performing a, a power clean. Uh, we're looking at extension through the ankles, knees, and hips as well to create and generate force through the lower body. Okay, and then finally, we have the speed range on the force velocity curve. This generally consists of high velocity sprinting, jumping, and throwing. Uh, so an example here, Olympic lifts, if we're training uh, speed strength, generally be done between one and 1 1.5 meters per second. And if we look at sprinting, if you run 10 meters in two seconds, which is doable, you're moving at five meters per second. So sprinting is generally the fastest thing you can do. So you definitely want to include that into your programs and high velocity sprinting is super important for injury prevention. So that was as we moved from the force aspect of the curve to the speed aspect of the curve, okay, as we moved through that velocity. So we went max strength to accelerative strength to strength speed, where we use that accommodating resistance with the bands and chains. Then from there, we moved to speed strength and into speed. Okay, so we can see here, these types of movements would go from force to velocity. So heavy strength movements, Olympic lifting, weighted jumps, med ball throws, resisted sprints, plyometrics, and sprinting. So you definitely want to try and include these throughout your program throughout the year, obviously in different doses, depending on the time of the year and competition you're in if you're working with athletes. Uh, but you want to definitely include exercises from the full range of the force velocity curve to increase general athleticism. Okay, so why is this important? Why is training like this important? Okay, a lot of times people say, oh, I don't really have to lift heavy. I'm not lifting weights out on the court. Okay, if we use basketball for an example, we can take the force velocity curve and break down movements in the game and see how that applies. So we can say, okay, a high force movement might be establishing position on an opponent, setting screens, or finishing through contact. Okay, so velocity isn't very high. If you're setting a screen, obviously you're standing still. But the force output to be able to stabilize your body is, is pretty high. Okay, and as we move towards the velocity end of the spectrum, we have things like attacking, okay, attacking the basket, jumping, cutting, scoring options, and at the very end with speed, we have fast breaks, transition, offense, defense, recovering from a, a mistake. Okay, so we can see how the sections of that force velocity curve apply to a sport like basketball. And this diagram here was taken from the Instagram account, Train With Push. Uh, they're another company like Gymware that, can, that has a device that you would wear on like a band around your arm, um, or you can put on the bar and it tracks velocity as well. So another example, volleyball. And there's no contact in volleyball. Um, generally, you're, you're just jumping, spiking, things like that. So how, do, how does like a, something like a max strength transfer to volleyball? Okay, so things like contested balls over the net. Okay, you're, you're essentially contracting an isometric position to block that ball. Um, and as you move towards the speed range, you have things like spiking, serving, setting, um, yeah, chasing balls, getting into position, different coverages and defensive actions. So you can see how something like the force velocity curve and training throughout those ranges would have transfer to volleyball. 
And finally, so we have how does it transfer to rugby? Okay, so depending on your position, max strength in rugby might be scrumming. Okay, if you're in a scrum, um, attacking the game line, getting hit, carrying the ball, evasive running, and just straight up sprinting. Okay. So we can see that training all the variables along the force velocity curve will ideally create a more powerful and robust athlete. So we've just looked at how training areas for max strength, accelerative strength, strength speed, speed strength and speed have transferred to sports such as basketball, rugby, volleyball. You can apply this to any sport. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching. This was our final segment of the Queen Strength and Queen Strength Summer Digital Series. So if you're looking for some more information, check us out on Gail, at Gale Strength uh, for some more content and training tips. Thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them down in the chat. All right, I think we're good.